Hi, I'm Tim Carter. Welcome to this live stream. It's um, it's a very random one. I, <clears throat> it's the day before Thanksgiving, and I had said yesterday that I wasn't going to do any more live streams until next Monday, which would be, um, gosh, November, <clears throat> excuse me, 29th. But I decided to do this live stream uh, to, as, as a test, actually, because I found out this morning, quite by accident, I was, I had to do, I, I wrote a new column and I went to discover on YouTube, if I, I have done so many videos in the past, I can't remember all of them. <laughs> so I went to YouTube and I typed in this, um, I typed in a phrase, I think I typed in indoor humidity. And then followed by my name, Tim Carter. So indoor humidity, Tim Carter. And I was stunned <laughs> to discover the number three video. Hi, how you doing, Costa family? Good morning. Uh, uh, anyway, <clears throat> I was stunned to see that the number three video in the research results was a live stream that I did four days ago or so. But the title of the video was Attic Insulation, the title of the live stream. But in that live stream, I talked about indoor humidity. So that told me that Google and YouTube, and good for them, because it's going to help you in the long run, that they are doing an analysis. They're, they're actually taking, they have artificial intelligence <clears throat> that is translating my what I'm saying right now into a closed caption. That is, I don't want to say it's hidden from you, but I'm sure when, when you watch the video, you can click the closed caption and and see it if you're if you are hearing impaired, and uh, it it picked up on the indoor humidity. All right, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk right now a little bit about frost in closets. It's a it's a pretty common problem. It's going to become more common here in the next few months as we get deeper and deeper into winter. But each winter, I get a lot of questions about people who own up their closet and and then they're looking for some clothes, they're rooting around and all of a sudden they look on the wall and there's a layer of frost on the wall and they like freak out like, oh my gosh, what's going on? So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about frost in closets. Pretty simple. Here's, it's just all that the frost is, it's just condensation that has frozen and uh, it's it's no different than the condensation that, that you might get on a glass of iced tea, on a can of soda, on a can of beer, when, when you take one of those cold cans <clears throat> out of the refrigerator or out of a cooler, and then you set it on um, on the patio table or the picnic table outdoors in the summertime. All right, so uh, what happens is the dew point of the can, the surface of the can, is lower than the humidity uh, of the, the the of the air, the relative humidity of the air, and so the the humidity in the air just immediately transforms from a vapor into a liquid, <clears throat> and that's what causes condensation. It's just a matter of the dew point. So, have you ever noticed? And this is really important. Have you ever noticed outside in the morning? If you go out early in the morning, you know, and it's and, and you might be down in Florida. Some like today's a very interesting thing here in New Hampshire. Um, it got cold. It was probably 24, 25 degrees overnight. And typically you might have frost, like on my truck windshield, I might have frost on it. Today, no frost, none, no, none anywhere. Well, why? Well, it was windy, big time windy overnight. And so the wind <clears throat> was causing, you know, what, what dew was forming, it was evaporating it. The, the, just like when you blow uh, on something, uh, it, it'll, you know, if you have something that's damp and you blow on it typically or put it on the wind, it'll dry much faster because the wind is taking all that, that moisture away. So when you have, when you go into your bathroom and you see fog on the mirror, you know, after you've taken a shower or a tub bath, um, you think, oh, well, there's just humidity on the mirror. You know, there's just fog on the mirror. No, there's fog everywhere. <laughs> There's that same fog, that same water vapor has formed on your walls 
and probably on your ceiling because they're the same temperature as the mirror in almost all cases. And, and actually, any exterior wall in your bathroom is much cooler, much, much cooler than, than the mirror. Because, you know, think about the mirror. The mirror is, is out away from the wall. So if the air temperature in your bathroom is 70 degrees, the temperature of that mirror is 70 degrees, all right? So you're going to get this condensation forming on your bathroom wall uh, much faster on the exterior walls that are cooler than you will on the mirror. But you don't see it. You don't see the fog and the condensation on the painted walls because they're not reflecting back the condensation that you see in the mirror. That's why you see the condensation on the mirror. All right. So why is it happening in your closet? Okay. Uh, by the way, if you'd like, hey, good morning, Louise. Um, I just decided, to, I, I'm just going to take a, a, I'm just going to explain something to you. I just decided to do this live stream as a test. And um, what, and you can do the test too and, and report back to me. <clears throat> what I'd like to know is, is maybe in an hour, if you go, <laughs> if you go to Google and you type into Google frost in closet, that's a very common search phrase that people type into Google. I'm going to be really interested to see if this live stream shows up in Google in an hour or two. So, uh, and if it, if you see it, I'd love for you to let me know. All right. <clears throat> so why is it happening in a closet? So typically the frost in closets is happening because the closet is probably one, of, one or two of the walls of the closet. It's on an exterior wall. And <clears throat> of course, when the closet door is closed, Think about this. Have you ever had one of those closets and, and you open up the closet and you immediately notice, wow, it's a little cooler in this closet. Like it, it, you can actually feel that the air temperature in the closet is cooler than in the room. All right. Well, why is that? So that's pretty simple. Most closets do not have a supply register in them. All right. You know, where if you have a forced air heating system, um, you don't have a supply register. Now, it's what's crazy is the closet in, in our, my master bathroom, our, our master bedroom closet is actually off the bathroom. And believe it or not, in my master bathroom closet, there is a small heat register because that corner of the, of the room is on an outside wall. And, and more importantly, it's on the north side of the house. So it gets really cold here in New Hampshire. So but in the average closet, you don't have a supply register. You, you, you know, so it's going to be colder in there because you've got the door closed. So that's number one. So the, the colder the surface is, in, in, on a, the, then, then the faster you're going to have condensation form on it. So you need to understand that. That's just really simple physics that you probably, it was one of those days in your high school physics class where you we're doodling in your notebook and you're, you're thinking in your head, like, I am never going to use this information. I am. How many times did you say that in school? I mean, I know I did a couple of times, uh, I, especially in math classes. And then look what happens. I go into the building trade where math is a really important skill to have. <clears throat> you know, you need to know how to do geometry and trigonometry if you want to be a good builder. Anyway. Uh, hi, Dominice. Uh, yeah, yeah. Look, well, here's the thing about looking it up. Um, if if I don't end, I need to end this live stream somewhat soon so that Google can index it. All right. So, you know, I, I lately my live streams have gone for like an hour. And I just keep jibber jabbering. All right. And so um, I seem to have something to say. All right, let's keep moving on here. <clears throat> also, if you like what you're hearing, please click that like button. That's really important to click the like button because I know I've discovered, uh, and I think there's a lot of videos out there about this, that like button is, it plays a big part <clears throat> in where Google ranks these videos and, uh, you know, in the search results. So the more likes, <clears throat> it's just telling Google that, that you obviously like what you heard or what you saw so that you can then help other people uh, discover something new too that might save them time and money. All right. I had cost of family. Just clean my furnace humidifier tray today. Yeah, you bet. Exactly. Um, in fact, I just, it's funny that you bring that up, Costa. Um, I just 
in the last hour, maybe 90 minutes, I revised a column on the, my Ask the Builder website about indoor humidity, and I was talking about the pads that are in the humidifiers and how clogged they get. And, and it's the same thing. In other words, the water that's feeding the humidifier has got dissolved minerals in it. So here you are, the furnace is blowing air, lots of air across that pad to evaporate the, air, the water to get the water into the air to increase humidity. Well, it leaves behind the mineral deposits. So you need to clean those pads off pretty frequently. And the best way to do it uh, is if you have one that you're supposed to clean, just soak it in some warm white vinegar. That's the best thing to do. So that's where you should have paid attention in your high school chemistry class, right? So the minerals that are on the pad are alkaline and white vinegar. A lot of people don't know it. It's a very mild acid. It's, it's a very weak form of acetic acid. So acids, if you remember from your high school chemistry, they dissolve alkaline deposits. All right. So just that's why you need to tell you anytime you have a chance, tell your kids or your grandchildren um, give them examples of why they need to pay attention in school. And just like, that's a great one. Just say, here's, I wish I would have paid attention in, in, in high school chemistry and because then I would, I, I'd clean my humidifier filter more often. All right, let's get back on track about the closets. <clears throat> so that you know now, you now know why the water condenses on the closet wall because it's cooler. And then when it's really cold outside, think about this, when it's really cold, the it's it, I know you might find this hard to believe, but the actual surface temperature of the drywall or the plaster in the closet can get below 32 degrees. Yeah, it's absolutely possible. All right. So that's when the water, the liquid water turns to frost. OK. So that's why you have it now. How can you prevent it? How can you prevent frost in the closet? It's pretty simple. Most people don't want to do this. Um, especially if you're an obsessive compulsive type, if you have OC, is that what it's called? Obsessive compulsive? Yeah. OC, uh, OCD, if you're OCD, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, you know, you, you want the room to look perfect. <laughs> so you want to keep your closet door closed. That's the problem. <laughs> you got to open the closet door. All right. And why? Because we already talked about it. There's no heat register in the closet. You need to get some of that warm air that's in the room into the closet. Um, also, in your bedroom, um, you may not feel it, but when the furnace comes on, or if you have radiant heat like I have, uh, there are invis the air is actually moving in, in the room. It, it, you can't see it. I mean, it's it's not moving so much that you actually feel it on your skin as you would if you stood in front of a fan, but the air is moving. So that moving air in the room is why you're not getting frost forming on the outside wall inside the room. Um, the, the And also you have more heat in the room. So the surface temperature of the wall in the room, <clears throat> that's the same wall that's in the closet. Instead of in the closet, it might be 30 degrees, but in the room, it might be 40 degrees. So it's not cold enough to form the frost, right? So the other thing to do is keep the keep the keep the door open, and then if you I know this sounds crazy, <clears throat> and, and think about this. Let's say you walk out of the room. Let's say you go to work, or you're in another part of the house during the day. What do you care if the door is open? Seriously, who cares if the door is open? And at nighttime, when the temperature's dropping, you're asleep. <laughs> what do you care if the door is open or not? All right. So you, you and and you want this you 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 want that water to evaporate off that wall because it's just going to cause mold and mildew and it's going to cause your clothes to mold and mildew. So that should be a strong enough um, reason for you to keep those doors open. Okay. So the other thing, and this is a little harder, if you have a really chronic bad problem, um, you can get a small fan, uh, just like a little one that you know that is on a stand, um, and just have a fan on low speed just trying to blow a little bit of air into the closet. And that air movement is going to help evaporate the condensation that's forming on the wall. All right. So you might have to move some of the clothes out of the way so that the fan air can get to that cold wall. But it's really just pretty simple. That's, a, that's all you have to do to stop the frost in the closet. Of course, you know, it helps if you, you know, you, you want to probably get a hygrometer, make sure you don't have too much air in the, in the house. 
So your indoor humidity should probably be no less than 40%. I would never have it more than 50%. So you can buy some, some affordable hygrometers, which is just a meter that'll tell you what your indoor humidity is. Um, you just don't want too much humidity in the air in the wintertime. Hi, William. How you doing? Good morning. Uh, vinegar is very useful. Uh, Domini says, yeah, you bet. Cleans tap, shower. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I've got I've got a lot of columns on my um, Ask the Builder website about how to use white vinegar. So uh, I'm really astonished. I, I just have to keep telling you, it just stuns me how you might find out about that, that I'm streaming live. So you must, you must have, I, I just don't, I, I guess I need to start following people who are doing this because I, I don't know how you magically know that I'm streaming live and then you you join the stream, which is just amazing. Uh, so thanks very much for doing that, by the way. The um, the one thing I want to tell you also is, um, um, <laughs> still alive. yes, um, I don't know who question mark is. Why would you think I wouldn't be alive? It, why don't you type, type something? Why? Uh, William, uh, my email is really pretty simple. Um, Tim at askthebuilder.com. I mean, just, and remember, if you want to get in touch with me, the easiest way always is just go to the askthebuilder.com website and there's an Ask Tim navigation link. Click that. Go there now and do it. What, look what happens. You can, you fill out a form, you, you, you can upload photos, you can send me a long message. Uh, that's the best way to do it. Uh, always just go to the website and go to the Ask Tim page. So um, anyway, yes, I'm still alive. Uh, so you want to know what are the steps in a retaining wall? Oh, we could actually, I'm going to write that down. That's a great um, topic for a future live stream. Um, let me write that down. All right. So, I, you know, by the way, I, I'm a, I'm a fountain pen guy. I, I don't know if you know that, if you can see that. So this is a true fountain pen uh, that, you know, like you had in grade school that uses real liquid ink. Uh, I've become a real fan of fountain pens. Uh, they're just amazing. You can put all kinds of different color inks in them. They're really, really great. All right. So retaining walls. Uh, William, I know I've talked about this in the past week. <clears throat> Anytime, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a really frog in my throat today. Jeez. Anytime you have a question about anything with your home, I don't care what it is, retaining walls, drywall, uh, leaking pipe, uh, toilet, uh, roof shingles, I don't care what it is, go to Google, type in retaining wall, Tim Carter, ask the builder. I know it's a lot to type in. Just type in retaining wall, Tim Carter, ask the builder. And magic's going to happen. Try that. Actually, while we're on the stream right now, go do that. Do me a favor. Just do that right now. And then report back in the chat what you found. Tell, tell us all about it. What you're going to discover when you do that, I, I wish you would please do it so that you can, so that the others on the live stream can, can see that it really works. Um, you're going to discover, I have a lot of columns on my website about retaining walls. And you're going to also discover when you read them that the science, the engineering behind retaining walls is very complex, all right? So what you're going to discover is the, the force, in other words, a retaining wall, you know, actually, most people think a retaining wall should be straight, and that's not right. You should actually can it back a little bit. You know, it should lean back into the hill, you know, like a little bit. And, you know, maybe three, four degrees. So, but here's what happens. The higher the retaining wall goes, and it, and you this, this one, it always goes back to high school. It, I swear, it's amazing. It always goes back to high school. So, you remember in your high school physics class when maybe your teacher shared with you a quote from Archimedes? Remember who Archimedes was? So Archimedes, I believe, was an ancient Greek philosopher, and he was a scientist as well. And Archimedes was pretty critical in figuring out, you know, what levers, you know. So, so you know, how, how does a lever work? You know, like if, if so this pen could be a lever, and, and my finger's a fulcrum, and, and if you put this underneath, 
you know, um, a, a something you want to lift up like a rock and you tilt this up, you can lift it up. All right. Well, here's what's interesting is that the longer the lever is, I mean, if it goes way out here, way, 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 way out, um, you have to use very little force to lift something up versus if you went down here, if, if this is the rock you're trying to lift and you just try to grab the rock and lift it, um, you know, and it weighs 500 pounds. I mean, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to exert more than 500 pounds of force to lift it to offset the force of gravity. All right. So the lever allows you, you know, to the longer the lever is, the longer, you know, I'm, my hand's going off screen, the longer it is, you might, and as long as the lever doesn't bend, you might only have to push down on the lever one pound to lift up 500 pounds. All right. Pretty amazing. So Archimedes said, is, is reported to have said, I don't know if it's true or not. I don't know if he wrote it. Who knows? <clears throat> it could have been changed over time. But he said, if I had a lever long enough, I could lift the earth. All right. That thing right there. The entire earth. <laughs> and he's right. He's right. I mean, the, the lever might be 500 million miles long out in outer space, but he could just push on it and he'd lift the whole planet up. All right. And off we go spinning out into space. All right. So what's that have to do with retaining walls? Because the retaining wall is a lever. So the higher the retaining wall goes, <clears throat> the less force it takes at the top to tip it over. All right. So you're going to discover all that. Um, we, uh, no way. No way, Dominique. You looked up Frost and that is crazy. Isn't that amazing? Um, thank you for doing that. That is absolutely amazing. Can you see the value in that? <laughs> I may start doing live streams all day long. <laughs> oh my gosh, it makes my head hurt thinking about it. Thanks so much for looking that up. So anyway, William, um, hopefully you went to Google and you typed that in. Like I said, type in retaining wall, Tim Carter. So that's four words. And then ask the builder. And you can either put Ask the Builder all together or three words, A-S-K-T-H-E-B-Y-L-D-E-R. All right, Dominic, thanks so much for looking that up. I really appreciate it. Um, remember, more thumbs up. We, we, we gain people, we lose people in the live stream. So here, I'll, I'll quickly go over the retaining wall thing. So it's all about mass. Here, 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 I, I have some photos actually on my website that I took of the own retaining the retaining walls on my own home here. So I live on a somewhat steep hill right above Lake Winnesquam here in New Hampshire, and I have um, I have two retaining walls between my house and the lake, and they're in excellent shape. They've been there twenty years. They're made with giant boulders. I mean, the boulders are oh my gosh. Um, the boulders are maybe four feet in diameter, maybe five. And uh, there's there's only like one or two two on top of each other. They're like one layer with some smaller rocks on top. But they have not moved in 20 years, man. Just And there's no mortar between them. They just took the rocks and stuck them next to one another. All right? Pretty amazing when you think about that. So mass. So think how big. Think how much of four or five foot diameter boulder ways. I mean, granite, granite, and they're all granite. They're all the Meredith porphyritic granite. Uh, granite weighs 150 pounds per cubic foot. So you could do the math. If you remember your, <laughs> your, your math class, right? What's the formula? What's the formula for the, the volume of a sphere? Um, it, that's a calculus uh, thing, by the way. So anyway, um, it's the uh, it's the derivative. Actually, what it is, <laughs> isn't that funny? I kind of remember this now. So the formula for the volume of a sphere is the derivative of the formula for the area of a circle. I'm almost positive that's the thing. If you're a mathematician, you can check that and let me know if I got that right. I remember that from calculus. Uh, oh, there you go. Thank you, William. Thank you. So keep that tip in mind if you... Want to find out all the information I have created about a topic? Just go to Google, type in the topic, and always keep your search term short. You know, like drywall or 
paint drywall. Don't, 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 don't type in, how do I paint drywall on a winter day? Don't do that. No, no. Just type in paint drywall and then type my name and then Google will give you all the results. Then you can fine tune it if there's too many. So that's a really neat search tip. A lot of people don't know that because they just type in too many things uh, in their search. Uh, yeah, I don't. Um, well, remember the, the formula for the um, volume of a sphere, um, because that's a three dimensional thing is different than two dimension. But that's why I'm almost positive. If I remember right, we're going back almost 50 years. It's a derivative. Of, I mean, I, I got an A in calculus, but it's been a long time since I've done it. So uh, der derivatives are a really early basic part of calculus. And of course, calculus is the mathematics of curves. That's what calculus is all about. And of course, the volume of a sphere, that's a curve, right? <laughs> so anyway, I'm sorry we're going off into math, all right? That's the trouble with these live streams. I go all over the place, all right? So maybe you like that. Um, exactly, something like that. Correct, exactly right. Um, all right, so retaining walls. I'll, I'll get back on the track here. I'm sorry. So the higher you go, the less force it takes to tip it over. So if you're going to build a tall retaining wall, you really have to engineer it correctly or, or, you're, or, you're, or all this work is going to be wasted. And I took a photo. This is really interesting. I, I, um, I'll, I'll actually upload that photo after the live stream to my retaining wall columns or at least one of them. So I had to get my truck repaired. I had to get a little body work done on my truck uh, in the past month. And back in... Oh, I don't know, October or se late September. I, I And I went to this guy's house who did the work. Uh, he's a, just an independent contractor. And he did a beautiful job, by the way. And he was much, much less expensive than a body shop. So he, he had a retaining wall at his house that was probably eight feet tall. And this retaining wall was leaning and almost ready to cut off this door that goes into his garage. And Somebody, when they when the retaining wall was starting to fail, <laughs> in an effort to try to save it, and it, and it was a, they, it didn't work. They 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 got a big plate of steel, maybe I'm trying to think now, maybe thirty inches square. I don't know how thick it is, maybe a quarter inch thick. It, it'll you can see it in the photo, and and they they drilled a hole. They drilled a hole in the center of the of the um, of the plate steel. And then they drilled a hole in the retaining wall. And then basically they were trying to make a helical anchor back on the back side of the wall so that so that it would keep the wall from tilting. Well, it didn't work. It didn't, it didn't work. Or if they did install this after the wall got to where it is, that that washer, that anchor is is working. But we don't know. We don't know because you'd have to measure it. You'd have to put a line and, and see if the wall's continuing to tilt over. So it's um it's all it's all about helical piers and and anchors but what happened is the person who built that retaining wall just goofed up they uh they didn't they didn't put the footing in right um it's too too narrow and it's just like anything else meaning if you stand up something pretty tall and it's narrow um and then you you can just push it right over whereas if you Put something, if you stand something up, but it's got a very wide base, a really wide base, you're not going to tip it over. So that's all about retaining walls. So retaining walls are very complex. Uh, if you're going to build a retaining wall that's two feet or less, no big deal. You don't have to worry about anything. But you start to get above three, four feet. And even that height, uh, they'll, they'll tip over uh, with not a whole lot of effort. And here in the Northeast, or if you live where it gets cold, um, it's a big problem because the frost in the soil, when the soil freezes, remember the frost, the, the water expands by 9% in volume. <clears throat> so the soil gets bigger. And so at the top of a retaining wall, you may think that the soil is going up. Well, it may go up a little bit or a lot, but you've also got the soil moving sideways. So the soil that's freezing at the top, if here's the top of the retaining wall, and the soil is against it, and it and it expands nine percent. It starts to push the wall over over time. So, retaining walls. It's <laughs> be careful of watching information on some of these cable TV shows where they just it's all unicorns and rainbows, and they say it's all so easy. Well, guess what? It's not. 
uh, you're going to see that photo I'm going to upload and you'll go, oh, gosh. And there's plenty of retaining walls around that have failed, that they, they were never engineered correctly. So I hope that helps you, William. I hope it does. Um, all right. I, I really don't. I've talked about the frost in the closet. I don't have much more to say about it. Uh, if you have, I'll give you one last chance here. If you, if you, if you have a question about your home, uh, anything that you want to ask me, I'll do my best to answer right now. And then I'm going to go downstairs and try to help with Thanksgiving dinner preparations. Uh, today is the day at the Carter house where we, my wife, Kathy makes all the pies. And so she teased me last night saying she's only going to make cherry pie. And, um, <laughs> she, she knows I hate cherry pie. <laughs> And the reason I hate cherry pie is because when I was young, probably 11 or 12 years old, um, one day on my street, there was a neighbor that had cherry trees, <clears throat> two beautiful cherry trees, and he let us eat the cherries. He, uh, you know, there, there were thousands of these things. And <clears throat> I ate too many cherries one day with a buddy of mine, and, and I got really sick. I mean, really sick. So that's an inner... There's a setting in your brain and in mine that, and it goes way back to, it's a survival. It's a survival setting that if you, you know, a hundred thousand years ago, if one of your ancestors ate some berries that made them really sick and could potentially have killed them, poisonous berries, there, your brain goes, we're not eating the berries anymore, man. <laughs> no more berries. <laughs> so um, that, kicked in in my brain. So it's like, so I love cherry lifesavers. I love the flavor of cherry, but I'm not putting a cherry in my mouth. I'm not doing it. All right. So, so she knows my favorite pies are pumpkin and, and pecan. So she's going to make a pumpkin and pecan. She was just teasing me. All right. That's what wives do after you've been married 47 years. <laughs> all right. Uh, question mark. How can I seal brick water is getting under, how can I seal brick water is getting under my roof? Um, those that sentence doesn't make sense to me. Just so you know, um, I mean, do you have a brick roof? I mean, I, I'm just saying that facetiously. I'm not trying to make fun of you. Um, most roofs are not made out of brick, so that's how that's my takeaway. Is that you want to seal this brick, and water's getting under your roof. So I'm assuming that your your roof is made from brick, but I know it's not. So that's a great. That's it. Once again, another great example of of how when you have a problem and you have a question and you want to see what I've written about it or, or, or the correct answer, all you had to do, and you, please do it now, please do this to show, to show not only yourself, but those who are watching the stream, go to Google right now and type in seal brick, those two words, then my name, Tim Carter. Just do that. Just type in seal brick Tim Carter. And then come back here and tell me what you find. Do what, do what, um, I think William did it. Um, yeah, William Googled it. And he says, William said, he, he did it for retaining more. He says, all kinds of info from you. So question mark, please go right now to Google. Type in seal brick Tim Carter. Tell me what you discovered. I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait for you to come back. Um, anyway, what you're going to discover once you get those results and, and once you dig in a little bit, you're going to discover uh, that I have I have t written about and told you about silane, siloxane sealers, you know, and actually water repellents. And silane, siloxane are the best ones. They're they're amazing. And you always want to get one that's oil based, not water based. You know, might be a little tough if you live in California. They've done everything. Uh, bingo. Exactly. Exactly. There you go. Right. Um, so there you found one of them, but there should be probably in those Google results, there should be at least four or five things of mine, you know, underneath that one. So, um, <laughs> there you go. Exactly right. I should be, but Dominice, just so you know, the reason I'm at the top is because you put my name in the search. If you see, here's the danger. Uh, this is actually a great segue. You need to understand that there's a lot of bad information out there on the internet. All right. A lot of bad information. And it's not always because the people have evil intent. It's because they don't know any better. All right. Um, they just don't know any better. So if you were just to type in seal brick into Google, 
you might not find my work for, you might have to go 30 pages deep into Google. Hardly anybody does that. All right. So, but, but what may happen is if you just type seal brick into Google and there's like the top three or four things, believe it or not, that information that you read at those top three websites, they, it may not be correct. And so you may go, well, Tim, if it's bad information, why is Google putting it in the top of the search results? <laughs> so have you not connected why? Google's a publicly traded corporation here in America. It's the obligation of the board of directors of Alphabet or of Google to make the most amount of money for their stockholders. They're obligated to do that. It's a profit business. So if you own Google, what would you put at the top three search results? Have you connected the dots yet? You're going to put the top three websites that make Google the most amount of money. Why do you think in the search results, when you type something in, you just like Dominic did a few minutes ago, he typed in Frost in Closet, and this live stream that's still happening was the number one video. Why do you think that is? <laughs> I'm not yelling at you, I'm just like, <laughs> it's because it's gonna make Google money, all right? So the top search results are not always the best information. Start spreading that around to as many people as you know. And in my case, if you trust me, then you just put whatever you search for in Google, just always then put my name after it, Tim Carter, and magic's going to happen. Okay. Sorry to, to, to do for that little rant, but I get really frustrated. I get really frustrated because... Most people, I think, are under the impression they they think that Google loves them. That you you may think that Google loves you. You may think that Google is looking out for your best interests. And you and you think that Google is going to put in the top of the search results the best information that's going to save you time and money. And you're wrong. <laughs> I hate to say it. it's tough love. You're wrong. That's not how it works. All right. So, um, <laughs> all right, here we go. Let's answer, let's answer some questions here. So enough of that ranting about Google. You know, Google's, a, I, I used to go out to Google all the time. I was invited out there. I used to call it the mothership. All right. So I was the poster boy for their Google AdSense program back in 2005, 2006. Uh, so, but that love affair ended in 2011 where overnight they took away 95% of my traffic. 90, imagine that. Imagine if your revenue got cut by 95%, your paycheck, all right? That's what happened to me back in two, February 2011. You can read about it. You want to read about that? Type, type this into Google one day. Type panda, just type in panda, like panda bear. Just type in panda Tim Carter or panda ask the builder. <laughs> read about that. All right, so... Um, Bingo. Exactly. I see what you mean. Page four. Exactly. Hopefully you've discovered a little bit about how everything really works. Just so you know, I'll, I'll say this, then I'm going to go answer those questions. It's always about money. I hate to say that. It's always about money. How, how sad is that? All right. Just follow the money. All right. So I have a slow, William says, uh, I, uh, I slow falling toilet. Any ideas? I plunge it and plunge it in the toilet. All right. So your, the, I, I, I don't, the slow, here's, here's what, um, here's what I think you're trying to communicate. I could be wrong and correct me if I'm wrong. You, um, your toilet might clog a lot and then you think it's slow flowing. So if it's an older toilet, um, so you can, here's how you prove that, that, that there's really nothing wrong with the toilet. Uh, well, 
there is a problem with the toilet, but there's nothing wrong with the drain line. If, if the toilet's clear right now and it just has water in the bowl, bowl, William, I want you to go get a five gallon bucket of water and I want you to pour that bucket of water as fast as you can into the toilet bowl without it overflowing. And my guess is you're going to discover that the toilet can take that water pretty quickly. I mean, very quickly. And I actually have a video that you can watch and you can actually see me doing it to see how fast I pour it in. So just go here to YouTube and type in uh, unclogged toilet, Tim Carter. And you're going to see that video that I did maybe three, four years ago. And anyway, but if your problem is you flush the toilet and it clogs frequently, it could be, <laughs> here we go again. Here we go again. Um, we're going back to high school. All right. <laughs> it, isn't it interesting how all of this connects back to high school physics and chemistry class? Have you thought about that? Uh, this is why you need to tell your kids and grandkids, you've got to pay attention. All right. So uh, remember that formula in high school physics, force equals mass times acceleration. So think about that. Force equals mass times acceleration. So it what that formula simply means is that the force will get greater um, if either the mass or the acceleration, if those numbers go up. All right. And here's an example, just simple math. So if you so force equals mass times acceleration. So that means if you multiply one times one, the ant so imagine if mass is one and acceleration is one, then the force is going to be one because one times one equals one. But what happens if the mass is two and the acceleration is 10? I'm just making those numbers up. Two times 10 is 20. All right, that's huge. All right, that's a lot bigger than one. So if you, so what's the water in the toilet tank represent in that formula? The water in the toilet tank represents the mass because you might have two gallons of water inside your toilet tank. And it's, 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 it's representing this mass of water that's above the bowl. All right. So that's called um, potential energy is what it's called. It's because it's energy that's up above it's stored energy. And as soon as you hit that flush handle, what happens? That water rushes through the hole in the bottom of the tank. It gets into the toilet bowl and it's accelerating. It's moving. That's what the acceleration is. And it's trying to push the waste, you know, through the toilet colon into the drain pipe. Well, guess what? Up underneath the rim of your toilet, you've probably never looked there before, but there are holes up there because when that water comes down to the tank, it goes two places. It goes into the rim of the toilet bowl because it's trying to wash and rinse the top of the toilet bowl. And then in older toilets and in some even modern toilets, there's a site, what we call a siphon jet hole at the bottom of the trap. And you maybe never have paid attention to this hole. Okay, so water rushes out of that siphon jet hole and it starts to push the water and the waste through the colon of the toilet. Well, if that rim underneath the toilet, after thousands of flushes has become clogged with calcium deposits, that's what happens. Uh, remember, just like we talked earlier, the humidifier pad that gets clogged with deposits. Um, if so if those holes get clogged, they're not going to let as much water through. And if the siphon jet hole gets clogged or partially clogged, it's not going to let the water through as fast either. And so as a result, you get a slow flush. And if you and if not enough water gets into the toilet bowl fast enough, then it's going to clog up. So that's the long explanation of what's going on. How do you fix it? Pretty simple. You're going to, once again, high school chemistry class, should have paid attention in high school chemistry class. You're going to go out and buy some muriatic acid, which is very toxic. Uh, brick layers use it to clean mortar off a of brick. And you're going to dilute it, uh, 10 parts water to one part acid. And you're going to um, carefully use a funnel and you're going to um, pour that into the overflow tube of your toilet. And that's going to get water down into that rim, the upper rim, to try to dissolve those deposits in the in the rim. And I have I have a column on the website about this explaining what to do. But um, and then 
you might pour some of this acid solution or just the pure acid into the toilet bowl water clean and and that will evaporate the mineral deposits down in the siphon jet hole. Do that and your toilet's going to really flush well. All right, so that's a long, long, long ex ex explanation. Um, there, bingo. Finally, I'm reading it. Uh, um, so uh, you don't need to use hot water when you flush the toilet, William. So it's still slow. So if, if you are getting, um, if it's still slow, then maybe you do have a partial clog in the drain pipe. Maybe there's a clog in the colon of the toilet. Uh, that's possible. Um, the only way you're going to find out is you, unfortunately, to those things, it's a little, you, it's more drastic. You're going to have to take the toilet off and, in, and inspect, you know, to see if there's a, a clog in either the colon or the pipe. All right. Simple as that. Um, exactly. Uh, yes, if you have water. Exactly. All right. Okay. So I've been on for 45 minutes. It's crazy. All right. <laughs> I um uh, I I thank you. I'm gonna thank you for tuning in. I'm gonna go down and try to help Kathy. And uh, I'm just really fascinated about this experiment. Dominic, if you're still here, thanks for looking that up so quickly. Uh, it's the top entry. Wow, that's really it's just absolutely amazing. What that tells me, I'm gonna think long and hard about it. Uh, the good news is, I may start to do a lot more live streams. They may be a little shorter. But I may go and start to do these very specific topics like this, and it'll help me get higher in the Google rankings. But it's also going to help you because you'll if you miss a live stream and you once again you type your problem into Google with my name followed behind it, you're going to find the information really quickly that will save you a ton of money. Um, oh, I have a question to ask you. Um, <laughs> this is kind of interesting. And you can respond in the chat. Uh, I guess I could do, I guess I could, let me try this real fast. Um, I'm going to try to create a poll. And here's the question. Um, would you pay 1000 I'm sorry, per hour to get advice on how to not get taken by a builder when you build your new home. Oh, my question's too long. There we go. That's it right there. Um, there we go. So take that little poll if you're still there. I know there's not that many here. Um, let me, I can't wait to see what you answer. Um, I don't know where the poll went to. Oh, William, that's a there it is. It ends up right there. Um, uh, yes, Google owns YouTube. Yes, yes. You may not know that. So uh, Google purchased YouTube from two. Um, I think it was Chad Hurley and and Stephen uh, and Stephen Chang. Chang, I, I might have that wrong. So just just type into Google uh, YouTube founders. And it's two guys, Chad Hurley and I think Stephen Chang. I actually met both of them. Um, but they started YouTube, I think, in 2003. Uh, it was at the time YouTube was was primarily uh, just used by young kids, like on skateboards. Uh, and they were just putting up these crazy videos of, of kids doing crazy things. Um, you have to understand that Google has some of the – back then, even back when Google started – they hired and had on on their staff some of the smartest people, you know, in 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 the world. And Google back in two thousand four understood that video was the future. So just so you know, what I'm doing here right now, um, and 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 what's which and you've seen YouTube grow over the past what sixteen years. It's many people prefer to use video to to discover how to do things. All right, even I. For example, if I need to repair my truck, I'll go to YouTube and watch a video about how to do something. If I, I'm because I'm not an auto mechanic, but I I can do certain things. Um, anyway, so Google bought YouTube, I think for one point. I have I'm close on this. I know 1.7, 1.8 billion dollars back in, um, you know, back in 2005, I think, and or 2006, and. 
Chad and Steve, <laughs> young kids. I mean, in their twenties at the time, they they were they could retire. They 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 had Sequoia Capital also owned part of YouTube at the time. They had gotten some venture capital, but Steve and Chad probably each walked away from that transaction with three, four, five hundred million bucks each. So good for them. Good for them. All right. So re read about that. But the answer is yes. Google owns YouTube, and Google makes a lot of money from it. I mean, huge money, huge money in each year from YouTube, from the ads that you see. Um, uh, no, no one owns me. I, I, uh, Ask the Builder is completely mine. I, I own all of Ask the Builder. I own um, the copyright on all of my material as an individual. Uh, so no one owns me except me. Well, maybe my wife owns me, Kathy. <laughs> Her nickname around the house is She Who Must Be Obeyed. All right. So um, I love my wife to death. Um, been with her 47 years, known her for 51, 52 years. Isn't that crazy? We were high school sweethearts. All right. So. Um, all right. Um, all right. <laughs> so I'm going to end the live stream right now. I want to thank you for watching. And I want you to have a great Thanksgiving. I, 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 I'm so glad I did this live stream. And, and I, I learned a lot from it. And I hope you are learning things too. And remember, if you've not already subscribed to my newsletter at the Ask the Builder website, you should do it. And you should also, if you've not purchased Stain Solver, a great product. Kathy and I own the company. It's a certified organic oxygen bleach. All right, it'll clean anything water washable. If you if you have a few extra minutes, I say this as often as possible. I'm serious about this. Go to stainsolver.com. All right, and see right here. I keep pointing to it. See that thing right there? What is that? That's a hat. All right, but it's also a lot of people call it baseball cap. It's a baseball cap. Go to stainsolver.com and type baseball cap in the search engine. All right, and when you get there, when you click the page. That, that comes back in the search result, I want you to look at the photo, the top photo, and I want you to stop right there and I want you to tell me what is the color of that hat? I mean, after after it's going to get cleaned, what color do you think the hat's going to be? All right? <laughs> the baseball cap. You're going to be wrong. I guarantee you, you're going to be wrong. <laughs> and I want you to slide up or, or scroll down the page. You're going to see the after photo, but then you need to read the story from Georgia. Georgia is the mother of the son whose hat that was. All right. All right. So read George's short story. If that does not convince you to purchase Stain Solver, nothing ever will. All right. It's got the highest amount of oxygen bleach I'm allowed to put in it by law. All right. So it's a great product. All right. All right. So um, I want to thank you for, for being here. I want to thank you for watching the live stream. I learned something really, really important this morning. Uh, it's so important that you may start to see lots more of these live streams. Uh, it's really, really amazing. So have a great Thanksgiving if you're living here in the United States. Uh, it's my favorite meal of the year. I cannot wait until tomorrow. It's, oh my gosh, I'm going to be brining. I'm going to start to brine our turkey probably in another two hours from now. I probably should record a video about it. Maybe I will. Maybe I'll record a video of what I'm doing. In fact, you know what? I think I will uh, because I, I talk about it. I might as well record a video. Okay. Thanks for tuning here. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you, William. Happy Thanksgiving to you too. Uh, it's going to be a great one here at the Carter house. Uh, the only thing we're missing is my oldest daughter, her husband and my granddaughter. They're going to be up in down East Maine. All right. But we're going to see them soon. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you learned something about frost in a closet, how to stop it. And um, make sure you subscribe to my free newsletter. Thanks a lot. I will be here, I don't know, who knows? I may be here Friday. I may be here Saturday. I don't know. We'll, we're going to find out. But thanks so much. Tomorrow, though, I guarantee I won't be here. I'll be spending all day with the family. That's, that's what it's all about. It's all about family and friends. Those should be the two most important things in your life outside of any religious convictions you have. So, all right. Have a happy Thanksgiving if you live here in the United States. Uh, and if you don't, Maybe you have a similar holiday in your country. In, and I hope whenever that is, that you have a wonderful time. I'm Tim Carter, and this is Ask the Builder. And you are most welcome for the information I'm sharing. 
it's my job to get as much of information out of this head here, these tiny gray cells as possible. All right. Have a great Thanksgiving. I will be back here soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.